So welcome everybody to tonight's event. Uh, a Q&A will follow the reading, so feel free to post your questions in the Q&A at, at any point tonight. For Barry students in the audience, uh, during the Q&A, a link will be posted that will take you to a form to complete for cultural events credit. So our speaker will be introduced by Shannon Rainey, a graduating creative writing major. Shannon has won numerous awards at Barry for her creative work and has had her work published beyond in Still Point Literary Magazine, Alabama's Best Emerging Poets, and the Allegheny Review. Shannon is editor in chief of Barry's literary and arts magazine, Ramifications. And so now please welcome Shannon Rainey. Thank you, Dr. Me. I would like to welcome all of you tonight to the latest in Barry College's creative writing reading series, the poetry reading with Tiana Clark. This reading is sponsored by the Georgia Poetry Circuit and Barry College. It is my honor to introduce to you our speaker for this evening, poet, essayist, and professor Tiana Clark. Raised in Southern California and Nashville, Tennessee, Clark earned her bachelor's in Africana and Women's Studies at Tennessee State University. She then graduated from Vanderbilt University with her MFA. Clark now teaches creative writing at Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville. She has work published or forthcoming in The New Yorker, Poetry Magazine, The Washington Post, VQR, Ten House Online, Kenyon Review, BuzzFeed News, American Poetry Review, New England Review, Oxford American, and Best New Poets 2015. She was a 2019 National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellow and a recipient of the 2019 Pushcart Prize. She also won the 2017 Furious Flowers Gwendolyn Brooks Centennial Poetry Prize and the 2015 Rattle Poetry Prize. Her 2016 chapbook, Equilibrium, was chosen for the Frost, Frost Place Chapbook Competition and her first full-length poetry collection, I Can't Talk About the Trees Without the Blood, won the 2017 Agnes Lynch Starrett Prize and recently the 2020 Kate Tufts Discovery Award. In a 2016 interview with the Adroit Journal, Clark spoke of drawing inspiration from Dr. Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. She says, it was the first time a black female writer was talking to me and I saw myself on the page. After writing a class speech about the book, Clark reports getting in trouble for discussing Angelou's recovery from sexual assault. Even then, she says, I remember that I liked making an audience uncomfortable with the truth. Even then, I witnessed the power of poetry as I recited Phenomenal Woman at the end of my speech. Clark's I Can't Talk About the Trees Without the Blood isn't afraid to confront its reader with uncomfortable truths about our society. Her lines have been described as muscular, and I think this is an apt description. Her poems are strong and sinewy. They'll punch you in the gut with no fatty, superfluous language to soften the blow. In the same interview, Clark spoke of the aha moment she had with her first collection, Equilibrium, after Charles Baxter said, to use her paraphrasing, that a good book should begin with an unanswerable question, which wrestles with this inquiry throughout the narrative arc. I Can't Talk About the Trees Without the Blood asks its readers many questions. In Nashville, we're asked, who said it? In conversation with Phyllis Wheatley, number one, don't you hate your name? And in number seven, have you ever been for sale? In The Eyes Have It, what are you? Where are you from? In Tim, who keeps the hours I can't remember? In the rhyme of Nina Simone, do they want you or your black pain? In After Amistad, do you know how privileged you are to learn about this? In Soil Horizon, how do we stand on the dead and smile? Can't we just let the past be the past? Clark's answer to this last question seems to be no. I carry so many black souls in my skin, she writes. And so when I think about a post-racial America, I don't. There's a few lines in Soil Horizon where the speaker is describing the earth underneath her, but I think they describe Clark's poetry as well. It's fertile with the past, organic and holy, wet as Dixie myth, romanticizing the dirt and undead. I found that this collection speaks primarily about three things. One, being Black, two, being a woman, and three, being a Black woman. Her work situates itself right at the crossroads, at that inescapable intersection of Blackness and femininity. Clark weaves together narratives of slavery, sexual assault, police brutality, religion, and casual racism, but does so in a way that celebrates the body, the Black body and the female body. I'm obsessed with the intersection between the sacred and sexual, Clark told Detroit, because I'm obsessed with the body. 
the nexus, the communion I took in church, the juice and crackers, all symbols I ingested every Sunday. For Clark, it's impossible to separate. We can't talk about the sacred without the sexual. We can't talk about the soul without the body. We can't talk about the body without the gender. We can't talk about the body without the race. We can't talk about the future without the past. And we can't talk about the trees without the blood that watered their roots. So now, 14 years after Maya Angelou spoke to Barry students and inspired a new generation of poets, it is my pleasure to welcome this phenomenal woman, Tiana Clark. Oh my God, Shannon, that was so incredible. Thank you so much. That was such a beautiful introduction. I'm, I'm, I'm really quite touched. Um, I'm, I'm actually kind of, I'm a little, I'm a little teary and speechless. Thank you so much um, for the really deep and thoughtful engagement with my work and tracing uh, the interrogative throughout it. I love asking questions and chasing questions and asking better questions of my questions. So thank you for that, that litany throughout my work. <clears throat> um, and you reminded me about that moment. Uh, I remember I was 11 years old and, and uh, performing that poem by Dr. Angelo. And um, so for you to link those two moments for me right now is just really special. Um, so thank you so much for your brilliance uh, and your time um, and your tenderness with my work. It means a lot to me. So, and thank you, Dr. Meek. Thank you so much to Barry College. Thank you for everyone that's here in the Zoom tonight. Thank you so much to the faculty. I feel really honored to be here with the Georgia Poetry Circuit. Um, I know there's lots of Zoom events going on, so I appreciate uh, your gift of attention tonight. Um, I'm gonna start actually off with a new poem. I visited Dr. Meek's class earlier today for a Q&A session, and I got asked a question about epigraphs, and I love epigraphs. And I told the class that I would read this poem because it's kind of my love letter to epigraphs. Um, it's called Broken Oath for the Epigraph, which begins with an epigraph from Erica L. Sanchez, which reads, who gave me permission to be this person? Oh, intertextuality, oh, little foyer to my poem, oh, little first and foremost, my amuse-bouche, meaning mouth amuser, a little glimpse of the meal to come. And if I could, I would add an epigraph over everything. Wait, who says that I can't? I've always been too much, and I'm just now beginning to cherish this too muchness booming late Baroque Rococo in my chest, little shells of scattered light decorating the caves in my poems. I wish people came with little epigraphs tacked on their foreheads, a little foreshadow couldn't hurt. I wish fruits had a few ripe lines above their blue numbers, a little sneaky peaky of the pulp to come. Oh, little cup holder for my quotes. I love how you hover over the house of my poem, like a cloud from another book or a bite from another lover, a way to say, I just couldn't help myself here. See, I cut out these lines for you like fuzzy flower stems severed at an angle, and they were briefly dead until I placed them in a vase on top of my poems, prolonging their life again, such moxie. Because if anything, the epigraph is a little clay container of water. And I placed these blossoms in a vase of life juice because you are visiting the home of my poem. And I want you to feel special. And I think fresh cut flowers might make people feel sacchariferous. At least they do for me, especially when my mother-in-law walks barefoot into her gorgeous garden and snips the long lit stems from the sun bursting forsythia bush even though we haven't talked in months, even though I wrote a poem about her that hurt her, a poem that started with an epigraph from Natasha Trethewey, and we talked about it over email and then over coffee, and then there was forgiveness, both sides, and that was it, see the flowers. I've always lo deeply loved Natasha Trethewey's work because her parents are like my parents, black mom, white dad, another type of epigraph, right? Do you understand what kind of permission that releases inside of me you understand how cellular and specific. Sometimes it's important to know about the blood before the poem starts. Who makes up these rules about procedure anyway? I come from clutter. I feel safe under that little liminal space below the title underneath the stairs and before that first line. Toy Derricott writes, I am not afraid to be memoir. Yes, I feel a great affection for Toy Derricott because she has a similar first name as my grandmother but spelled differently. And also because she drew her beloved dead fish, Telly, in my copy of The Underdaker's Daughter, writing, Telly loves you with the bubbles and everything. Well, then I'm not afraid to be the epigraph, damn it. I am joyfully trying to break every rule about poem making that I know. 
I want to wake up and like myself more. I want to wake up and like myself more. I want to wake up and like myself more and believe it each time I repeat it. I want to revel in my poems the way Danica Kelly does. Have you heard Danica talk about poems? Do it. Absolute pleasure. I want more of that giddy precision. I want to wake up and address myself like the badass motherfucking epigraph that I am. Hello, epigraph. I am beginning my body before my body begins. I want to start my day with somebody else's words. For example, this morning, I started with Ross Gay's The Book of Delights, and I keep grinning and underlining words like delight radar and delight muscle and that image of stacking delights like pancakes. And I can hear Ross's voice as I read them, his joyous timber, almost sing, shouting inside these smile-inducing sentences, which linger over the blue length of my day. And I just got back from AWP in Portland, where I heard Jose Laveras say, lean into link on a panel about poetry podcast. I wrote it down and underneath his words scribbled, possible epigraph? Epigraph, a little foreplay, a little playful forest. I'm safe now so I can play. A little forecast of my mood and tone, a little incantation, little wordy satellites in the white spaces orbiting the sky parlor of my poems. Epigraph my father, epigraph my father I've never met but how I meet and let him go at the beginning of every poem that I write. It isn't lost perpetually dripping sap from the injured trees bruised or cut in our knuckles as we write. Sticky sap spilling from the wound, pitching to survive the bites. And aren't we all writing the same damn poem over and over again anyway? Didn't Jack Spicer allude to that once while translating Lorca? I wanna go back to that first epigraph. The easy association would be God, right? So like this, God coos above the waters of the pre-world, scanning over all that gooey potential, a bajillion possibilities, millions of us already there, little epigraphs in the making, gleaming in that first sentence struck light, the imperative big bang of God's never ending breath. But, but what if that first epigraph wasn't so spectacular? What if it was just someone messaging me on one of those spit in a tube DNA ancestry sites saying that they're my second cousin, saying they know how to get in touch with my dad or oh, the sheer possibility I cried and did and didn't know why, saying that they gave him my number and email address, saying that they told him I didn't want or need any money, but how he still never reached out. Okay, since I can't hear you or see you, y'all are gonna have to show some love in the chat. I'm gonna have to see something. <laughs> if you feel so loud, I won't, I won't make the praise be compulsory. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so this whole reading is inspired by Dr. Meek's class earlier. Um, I normally don't read um, my Balanchine series that I have in the collection, but I was really inspired because there was two dance majors in Dr. Meek's class and they were asking me about kind of studying uh, dance and how I kind of developed that lexicon for that kind of language. And, um, and so I wanted to read the Balanchine series that I have in the collection. It's so interesting. So I was also talking about the book is a triptych off of the title. I can't talk about the truth about the blood, but there's also many triptychs within triptychs. Um, and this is another kind of trilogy within the collection. Balanchine teamed up with um, Stravinsky and created these three ballets, um, uh, Apollo, Orpheus, and Aegon. And so they kind of sit in the middle of the collection with Nina Simone. So I'm gonna read those three poems. Um, and this first one is After Apollo. And it's a pas de deux with, um, uh, and it's choreographed by George Balanchine, 1928. Their flexed fingers delicately click and breathe together. The fluid dance begins as if God and Adam are closing in. There is so much delightful prosody, all white in the middle of her lustrous muscled legs swaying over the golden head of God. Three times Apollo takes her petite wrist, dips her down toward the smooth and continuous earth, spilling the muse like a porcelain cup, pouring more cream on cream, backgrounded by a stage of Prussian blue. Steely arrows inside the storm colored eyes of Apollo as God lifts her again over his clavicle and she is draped against his back like warm bath water poured over and streaming down the knotted spine. As Stravinsky's strings stretch and vibrate the wooden cavity of taut instruments. 
how the dancers make a frothy waterfall of each other's Caucasian bodies, all adagio, calliope, polyhymnia, balanchine, or offstage. No one is talking here. Apollo was just born, and now she is rearing the child inside of him. With her back to me, she sits on the trunk of his legs and offers him her liquid gifts through her wet and taut positions of ballet shows him how she splits herself as I have again and again for such a gorgeous, foolish God and man. So this next one after Egan um, is the one I was most interested in. And it's a pas de deux with Arthur Mitchell, which was the first um, black uh, uh, ballet dancer in the American ballet and Diane Adams. And it was the first interracial duet ever um, in the American ballet. And I'm actually gonna play a snippet from a documentary that's gonna show them dancing because I really want you all to see the visuals. It's just like two minutes and then I'll, I'll read the poem um, off of this. So I'll share my screen, a little screeny. Okay. In Balanchine's hands, classical ballet incorporated the past and the present. And nowhere was this more apparent than in Agon a ballet that reconciled the French dance forms of the 17th century with the anxiety of the 20th. In its nervous intensity, its nakedness of execution, Agon was unlike any ballet that had ever been made before. Okay, I'm saying you can't, you can't see the video? Okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, <laughs> Um, I don't know what to do. Um, Sandy, any help here? I don't know. Maybe. Um, it, it's, it's set so you should be able to share your screen. Um, oh, are you, you know what? I didn't hit the yeah, share button. Yeah. <laughs> that might help. Zoom University. Okay. In Balanchine's hands, classical ballet incorporated the past and the present, and nowhere was this more apparent than in Agon, a ballet that reconciled the French dance forms of the 17th century with the anxiety of the 20th. In its nervous intensity, its nakedness of execution, Agon was unlike any ballet that had ever been made before. Balanchine and Stravinsky shared a deep sense of responsibility to the past. The classical tradition made possible an exchange of ideas over time, across the centuries. Stravinsky used works by other composers as the subjects for his own. Ah, I don't want you to see all this crap that I watch on YouTube. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing, okay. I always hate that on YouTube that it shows that. Um, okay, so, that was a little bit of the dance. Okay, so I'm gonna read after Aegon. I was trying to get my YouTube before I did that. <laughs> I could see the Harry Care videos that I watch. Okay. Um, after Aegon. A battle of skin movement through and under and perpendicular. I want your forearm on my forearm like that. White woman, black man and constant cruciform. Duet, touch her ankles as if thick lilies grow there. Pluck her wrist as if it is your wrist there. Are you the caregiver or patient? What sickness can I fondle that isn't already inside me too? 
Can you hold the body on point as if to cut the invisible knife between us, atoms splitting themselves by racial? One and two and one and two and what are you? Insert skin atonal, cradle my torso, teach me to walk again. Tanaquila Cirque, Balanchine's wife lost her fond legs to polio. Diana's able body is her body now, but muses don't need to strut, to run, to be. This music is, is, is making me anxious. That's it, stop and start again between breathing soft iron lung, staccato a la Stravinsky, insert, inhale, exhale, Arthur is all a plum. Arthur is what black is, muscular and agog. Diana's leg, alabaster and arabesque above Arthur's head. Her leg, a needle through the eye of him. Her leg, a slow hour hand in silk pantyhose, a light on Arthur's clavicle. Physical clock, the intricate machine, one and zero, one and zero. Arthur, move the white woman there and there, now here. Diatonic and clumsy violin chords pull frenetic. She cannot move without you tending to her limb. She cannot move without you glazing her stretch and sway. Her far reaching frosted legs bend and slice little angles lush with geometry one and two, one and two and three and four and five and six and six, I mean six. Ah, so much fear that is and is not here. The audience watches the fight adagio tangle and unweave weave and untangle whatever struggle is in my skin let it dance upon my mulatto body to make my thighs twist and weep oh arthur what is mr b telling me here i've been staring at the only picture of my dad he is holding my mom at her hips i am trying to find what parts of me are his she is smiling and he is smiling but he does not show his teeth and then the last of the trilogy after orpheus how to do with your Eurydice. Eurydice. The son of Apollo has no voice here. Only the music of Stravinsky's symphony, the dancers sing with their unbolted bodies, wholly lengthened and phantasmagoric. The dark angel leads him through the lyre, through unfolding underworld, his hand another type of lung breathing. Balachin wanted the audience to see each finger splayed and reaching and extended. But when the anxious Orpheus tears off his mask, the ballerina collapses for the floor. The curtain fellows and the oboes are gone. I think about patience and its stupid song. I can't wait. Yes, I'm always looking back at my dad. Which leads me into the rhyme of Nina Simone, which I'm gonna read in length tonight. It's a long poem, so just buckle up, get comfy in your jam jams and your little couch or if you're in your bed. Um, so this last section of poems I'm gonna read. Um, thank you, Shannon. A lot of the, um, I was having trouble with some of those mythological names. Um, I'm sure some of you Greek, Greek people could help me there, but um, Nina Simone is in the fulcrum of this collection and I got really obsessed with her after watching her documentary, What Happened to Simone, I highly recommend it. I was also studying at the time, 18th century British romantic poetry. You might be thinking, hmm, how does Nina Simone fit into that? Um, but I was, I was reading and explicating the rhyme of the ancient mariner, my Coleridge, and I was thinking who would be that mariner in, 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 in my life that would kind of stop me, right, on my way to a wedding and kind of warn me about their epic tale. Uh, and at the time I was in grad school and kind of, it was an amazing time, but it was also a really intense time confronting my relationship to the canon and my relationship to the page. And Nina Simone seemed like this perfect a uh, kind of figure to interact with her ghost and, and as a way really to have a conversation with myself, a way to kind of have a foil for the speaker to engage with art and activism, um, with blackness, um, with gender, and look at poetry as a means of persistence and survival. So the, the poem is a long conversation really. Um, so these last few poems are all have to do with um, music. So I'll, I'll, I'll read this one and I have another poem about Coltrane, one about Kanye West and we'll end with Rihanna. How does that sound? So this is the rhyme of Nina Simone, um, which begins with an argument. How a slave ship was driven by capitalism and racism inside the triangle of the slave trade and of the strange things that befell and in what manner Nina Simone came back from the dead to her own country to stop a graduate student on her way to workshop. I'm gonna have to take a sip of tea first. This is a long poem, hold on. Okay. I didn't recognize her at first. 
the felt urgency inside her glittering eyes, grotesque and morganite melting blooms, her skin stabbed with hammered copper, Afro nimbus, the luminous gaze, an x-ray swishing at my skin with metronomic waves, time worn but regal, her spine made of satin and salt, her bolted black back clutching every battle-born ballad, a lone column of glissandos and thunder snow, booming and bright. Come here, she says. Sorry, I can't, I'm late. I'm, I need to tell you something about yourself. Listen, little girl, for every pain, there's a longer song. The body pours its own music. I wanted to play Bach and Beethoven for endless encores, but they wouldn't let me and they won't let you. Things have changed, Miss Simone. I have a scholarship. They want me here. They want my poems. They want, they want you, she says, sucking her ghost teeth or your black pain. What's the difference, I say? <sighs> Does your mother know what you write? Yes, but not the mother poems. She grabs my shoulders, slides her shivering hands down my stiff arm. She's holding me like an auntie. I soften and she's got me and I'm hers. Nina begins. During revival, syrup would fly from every black boned believer, releasing righteous temper. The holy roller ghost caught me young blue, myself southward to quiver at the touch of Jesus. Jesus, we'd shout on refrain, shred and siphon maple from marrow, silver spiles biting delicious bark, tapping fluid sugar and red kino from our rough hewn throats every Sunday morning for the first service and for choir practice at three and 6 p.m. and Wednesday night for prayer meeting and Friday night for choir practice again and again, drizzling the pews of pure delight and little me at the piano sweeping up all that sway, all that fantastic black energy from the preacher and the congregation. It was a white lady, Miss Mazzy, who taught me to sit and play correctly at the piano, use the oil in my shoulders and not my wrists eight hours a day until the ivory keys and my pirouetting fingers became one gigantic song. A symbiosis, symphonies like burning white lies saponified with my skin. I stopped reading the sheet music and closed my eyes to lit a charcoal, felt the night ocean stirring beneath growls from the furthest habitations of my blood. As my wavering body became a front porch row of rocking chairs facing east, always east toward France, before I even knew I wanted freedom from freedom. Felt glacial depths, wet and coffinless, transatlantic moan, simmer and hiss, beautiful sharks inside me, water boiled into black mist, cumulus clouding into songs of resistance, hovering above the slavers, pitching slippery deck, easier access to the winches pinned in still cages, gripped hands lacquered like abacus beads on bars. Different tongues mosaic with gold, ivory and pepper coast medallies, cradling starless nights. Every time I loomed the deep, I became another person. The body is a ship constantly cutting, lathering water and the way ships yearn for imagined shores bobbing in the immediate distances. My low contralto rasping in the offing chased the dipping prow. Above the moon drenched water, rippling with magnificent milk, and midnight flashing. I sailed the white froth of my suffering until everything bled clear, till there was nothing in my mouth but the wounded side of Jesus where they knifed him. So there was nothing but loose gravel, diminishing applause. What about your missing teeth? I ask as I attempt to touch her face, her cheek, her skin shuffling into a wooden artist's palette gauzy and dripping, dreamlike, oil thick paint smearing pinks and reds and browns with knives, carnations for eyes. I reach inside her cave pool mouth for broken keys in the 22nd century. Cabernet bruises on her lovely love head and lips. Punches from my albatross hung around my neck, she says. I shot the thing that was hurting me, my husband who brought the fog and mist. Slime green with my money and decay, dead necklace. I was carrying the dead load of his animal stench. Oh, how he loved to work me like a dray horse. And I bucked until I adored his sable fist more than the sex or the furs and cold storage or the baby's little fingers reaching, reaching for my pearls or the yellow pills to keep me singing and galloping across the glistering globe. The whip has always made the body dance and crack. I jerked and wailed spasmodic, me the black spider, damned by angry gods and angry hands in the hands of an angry god. I dangled over wildfire. The art of tamping espresso, folding dark meadows inside my throat, fluttering uvula, lone pink hibiscus and praise. I am buckled my trauma one note at a time. 
One note at a time, I unbuckled my trauma. Woke up drenched in cold sweat and furiously tried to remember my only dream. Finally, playing a Bach cantata at Carnegie Hall. Finally, the audience would shut up and listen in the way I would need them to listen to me. All quiet as fresh snow muffling early morning trees, a hushing frost on the meadow sparkling with untracked fondant. But it never happened. They only wanted cocktail jazz, folk and blues for me to bleed Negro, a signifying monkey for my classical piano. They only wanted that swing low, sweet chariot strain, but I smashed it all together anyway, making and breaking forms on the bridge between my voice and finger play. My vinyl sorrow spinning, spinning the grind against the cusp of needle, my record swarthy as the beloved skin of cane bitten. I silenced the audience with one long glare. She pauses to show me her famous mid-tongue stare. Like a ghost ship, I wandered from stages to states and countries and colleges, concert after concert. I unglued myself in hotel mirrors until I disappeared, visions of laser beams and skin, always skin sliced in heaven, lingering scent of a burnt out bulb, still incandescent, the weirdness. They said my blue note baritone could find the tiniest sack of unsent tears inside anybody, any body. Call me black bitch, diva, demanding, difficult, depressed, genius, monster. They don't call me that here. Well, not to my face. I can write about anything I want. I think here, here are the dead bodies and bullets in my work. Here are the four little girls. I say as I hold up my poems. Look, if you can write about anything you want, then write about anything you want. Why do you keep panting and hunting black hurt black scars like a slave breaker? Why scratch the white page like a master for old blood? Like a god, you are so thirsty, hell bent on carving beauty from dead bodies, from sacrifice on the altar. Because I listen to the trees humming through the poplar leaves and southern magnolias, bloated faces, these beauteous forms still swinging limp pendulum, waxy bleach white blooms, egg whites inside the hard boiled eyes, sway and rock and roll forward, fragrant. I am ready to find the ruined churches. I have a second stomach now. Now I can look at my dead and listen. I'm transcribing the soap splattered leaves. You sound so tired, my darling. Are you weary yet? She whispers in my ear of creating and fighting. Can you stay a dog chain barking every threat out of breath in the darkness? And the darkness is always you panting for more food for what? To get published for this? Yeah, this. I need to be here in the workshop. I must look them in the face and tell them when their words and worlds are making me uncomfortable. Tell them when my chest tightens and flares up when they try to conjure the other. A fantastic field of fictitious black and brown bodies. Tell them that my body is real, not imagined, not a prop or a literary device, not foil, not craft, not carnal, not chocolate, not mammy or mask or persona, not opposite of the white gaze. I must tell them that my lips, butt hair curlers are mine. Urban slang, long fingernails, arrested dialectic are mine. Burning erotic hot and top blue bandana, Beyonce like like liquor, blasting the classroom with my noisy stereotypes, shouting, I am here. You cannot write around me. The periphery is also mine. I'm not afraid to take up the space I need to survive. I'm not afraid to write what I need to survive. Write what you need? <laughs> Be careful now. That might snatch that money real quick when you start talking revolutionary. What's your compulsion? The slave ship, war machine, Robert Hayden's Jesus Savior pilot me. I can't talk about the trees without the blood. Baby, you can't put a fire out or hold a flood. Didn't Emily D say that? Didn't you learn a thing that can ignite can go itself without a fan upon the slowest night? Why are you still afraid to say goddamn? feels wrong, like I'm sinning, like God can't see my face. I know I'm not sinning, leftover fear from church makes my sternum lead heavy about to break. Then you're not ready. It's not enough for you to be young, gifted, black, and angry. I write a few poems about the body, the body, the body. She says, mocking me with her hands. <clears throat> then points her diaphanous finger in my face. You have to stay mad your whole damn life. 
You have to make love to the damage in your mind, return to the throbbing meadow you know will pain when you enter the middle of its wild scrape. Pick up your stone, find water, just let it skip, baby. Let it skip. Like birth, all this pushing, all this labor leads to life. Has a man ever hit you? No. Have you ever wanted a man to hit you? Yes. Why? I wanted to feel as bruised as you did on the inside. Something cellular, like begging on my knees because it was still someone touching me besides myself. Because fathers, because poems are part animal, part pain machine, tearing at flesh, wholly somatic control, I guess. And in that brief moment before climaxing, when I choose to release my thighs inside another aching vessel and that slick, dark, dank slave ship heat. And in that moment right after they come, when I dislike myself the most, that's when I want to be punched with how lonely I am. What the hell is your maiden name? Night. Why did you change it? Thought I was supposed to, wanted to be married so damn bad that I, I didn't think about saving my name. But I heard the snipping bifurcation from black women in my family, ripping and weeding me from the soil and scion of single mothers on their knees chalked with ash, interceding for me, a curse my mother would say and pray away till she walked me down the aisle to a white man from a good family on the good side of town with good credit. You like this white voice, don't you? Yes. Why? I'm attracted to things that once owned me. I'm attracted to men who don't want me, men who give me their seed and disappear when I'm born again and again and again. She saunters back to her grave, hunting, humming something familiar I cannot name. I almost catch the hem of her song, but it slips as she slips away. I walk to class, my spine a grounded state, lit with liquid brass and burning peaches. Bewitched, ready to flame, I enter the room. Bursting. I need a few steps up that one. Thank you for the love. Okay. Let's let's spend a little time with John Coltrane. This is actually from my um chapbook equilibrium. I got I've been very lucky with covers. So this one's from Terrence Hayes. Can anyone guess what this one is? If you already know, don't say it. Um, she did the Michelle Obama portrait, uh, Amy Sherald. Um, a blue note for Father's Day. Thank you all so much for the kind comments. It means so much to me. Because I don't know where you are, I send you a letter of tree leaves. I heard this morning harmonizing like emerald waves above a pond. I send you John Coltrane who locked himself in a room of amethyst for days with no food or mercy to write a love supreme. We destroy ourselves for splendor, emerging from the buried deep like cicada song to mate and disappear again. Today, I will not be bitter about this holiday or the Facebook post. No, today I send you a roofless church, a grotto with fuzzy moss and trickling water that sounds like wet piano keys. Please know I've made good with my life. With or without you, I know how to kneel before imperfect men. I know this pond can carry cold morning skin like blue, blue notes pressed from warm saxophone buttons for acknowledgement, resolution, pursuance, and psalm. Dear Father, I hope you know that I can love the absence of a thing even more than the thing itself that I can have one day a year that doesn't beat like the rest. There is no number in my phone to call. There is no home with his face I remember. Just a place called nowhere. And this is where I find and lose him like a savior. Okay. I'm having this itch to change my set list. That's why I'm, I'm pausing a little bit. I'm like, do I want to read my Kanye poem? I haven't read this Kanye poem in forever. That's so why I'm looking at it like, I'm like, Kanye, do I want to read you? I don't know if I want to read you. Um, I'll think I'll, 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 let me just end with Rihanna. It's always a good call to end with Rihanna. Thank you all so much for your time and attention. BBHMM after watching the music video.
I too want to be naked, zebra striped, and the almost dry accountant's blood, sticky and sucking a fat blunt inside a Louis Vuitton suitcase, brimming with the newest money. This is another way to see myself too, and the way Rihanna nooses a white woman up by her smooth feet, a blue blooded pendulum swaying as her beautiful tits look more perfect than ever. Why did that image excite me so? No, not the tits, but the simulated lynching. It feels so damn delicious to say bitch, bitch better, bitch better have my money inside my mouth. I hate it when people talk about black artists being capitalists. Why can't we thrive in something rich and green too? And let us be loud about it. Let us be loud without consequence. Remember when we were dating, I wanted you to pay for every meal. And yes, the movies taught me that love was someone reaching for the check first. But there is no such thing as a free lunch. Someone has to pay with the fruit from their body. Yeah, I'm spreading my legs for someone else because I'm hungry and always at the end of some kind of altar. Even now I'm paying for my doctor to reach and scrape inside me to say I don't have cancer. She tells me I need to start thinking about babies because of my age. I think, bitch, I'm not ready. There will always be ties and offerings. At my church, they called it first fruits. My mother gave me quarters and as a kid, I waited for the clink at the bottom of the bucket being passed. I believe God heard this too. Somewhere, someone is counting the cash behind a velvet curtain. Once a boy said, suck it bitch, with his heavy dense hand at the back of my head pushing. Pushing is another way to mean pay me what you owe me. I didn't forget. I see the total at the bottom of the receipt. I used to have so much debt. I was forever in the wettest red. Thank you. Always end with Rihanna. That's my, that's my, that's my, that's my main poetry advice. Okay, questions. <laughs> that was fabulous. Such Thank a fabulous you. reading. We are Thank starting you. to get a couple questions. Please, everybody, um, please do post your questions in the Q&A. Oh, before, I, I did yes. want to say, sorry, Sandy, I made a Nina Simone playlist because one of your students oh, asked. Oh, right. Um, yeah. Thank you, Christian. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you for the love. Um, and so I made a little... Someone asked me what were some of my favorite Nina Simone songs. So I've added them. Uh, oh, it's just to the panelists. Hold on. Um, let me throw it here. So here's my little Spotify. These are some of my favorite Nina Simone songs that I love very much. Awesome. The name of all, so my name, so the first was my chapbook, Equilibrium. And this is, I can't talk about the trees without the blood. So cool. All right. So we have a question from Sarah Kersey. And she says, I remember you said once it took you two years to edit and complete the rhyme of Nina Simone. Your new long poems are centered in joy. And I wonder what the differences are between them when it comes to editing and craft. Joyous poems are harder to write, but are they easier to edit or just different? Do you edit your long poem by sections or movements or as a whole? Hmm. Thank you, Sarah. Um... Yeah, I think each poem has its own kind of rhythm and system to it. Um, I don't, I think in terms of joy, I think maybe joyous poems feel better as you're writing them. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, I think the Nina Simone one was a whole different beast because I was very much conjuring her energy and her presence and her biography. Um, and I was kind of, Again, I, I love history, so I was I was very much immersing myself in the history and in that time period. So that poem that poem took a long time for me to edit because I really had to work with dialogue, and um, that was that was a new thing for me to learn. And so I read some plays, and I also talked to some playwrights, and I really wanted to I, I eavesdrop to a lot of conversations where you would have like natural interruptions. And the first couple of drafts of the rhyme. Um, the voice was very similar. Nina's voice is very similar to the speaker's voice. There wasn't a lot of distinction. And it wasn't until actually I was working with Carl Phillips at Breadloaf where he kind of questioned me and said, if Nina came back to life, would she really be sounding like this? Because I think I, I wrote her a little bit angrier in the first drafts, where she was dead and kind of free because she felt very used up by the movement. She felt that actually, because she actually lost a lot of record sales and her record company dropped her for, for her more... Um, 
for her songs that were dedicated to civil rights. So she felt kind of used and abused because, uh, you know, in the late 70s and early 80s, she really kind of fell out of the zeitgeist. Um, and so I was trying to conflate a lot of those things and what it meant to be a Black woman and a Black woman artist. Um, I think earlier, um, for me, long poems are the same kind of considerations that I have with short poems with editing. So I think those same kind of instincts are there. Um, for me, sometimes it's easier to chunk it down and look at different sections. Um, Nina Simone kind of tumbled out of me and then I, it took me two years to kind of go back. And so I would look at a, a draft, you know, an editing process might be, I'm just looking at line breaks or I'm just looking at the image systems or I'm just looking at my metaphors or I'm just looking at the dialogue. And I would work on each of those kind of craft techniques until I had exhausted myself and all the possibilities and there, were, there was no sense of surprise left for me there. So I think the same intuitive things, whether it's a joyful poem or a sad poem or a sex poem or a love poem, um, all of the craft techniques come into play there. And oftentimes I don't ever really sit out to write either a joyous poem or a Nina Simone poem. I, I'm just obedient to the poem that's in front of me. Um, and so each poem is so different in what it demands. You know, like I said, some, some rumble through you like lightning, some drip, and I'm just kind of obedient to those rhythms. I don't try to force it. Um, but yeah, thanks for the question. I also have two sort of related questions. One, what inspired you to start writing? And the other, what was the first poem that you ever read that truly inspired you? Mm. Uh, I think both answers could be uh, answered with high school. Um, I talked to Dr. Meek's class earlier that I had an amazing creative writing teacher named Bill Brown who introduced me to contemporary poetry. And it was the first time that I heard the young Lee and Sharon Olds and um, you know Frank O'Hara and um, T.S. Eliot. Um, and I was like, I think it was actually T.S. Eliot's Burnt Norton, that book. Um, I didn't know what the hell he was talking about, but I loved the language. I just fell in love with the language. And I remember going to the library and reading it just over and over and over again, like what might, what might have been and what has been points to one and that was always present. And I kept on saying that over and over and over again to myself. And again, I didn't know what I was talking about at the time, but the language just sounded, um, again, it's that, was that like this metronome was lit inside of me. And um, I think hearing, especially Sharon Olds, I remember he had a copy of The Gold Cell, one of her books, which was highly inappropriate to probably have for a high school because um, there was so much like sex and bodily juices in it. But I remember just thinking like, what is this wild text? And it just like, you know, I'd grown up in church and I felt like there's all these things that I wasn't allowed to say and wasn't allowed to do. And here was this woman poet just like owning the body in a way that I felt so disconnected to at that 16 year old, I mean, at 16 years old. I mean, so often um, a lot of my work traverses over a religious landscape because I'm really interested um, in the sacred and the sexual, which both has to do with pleasure and pain. You think about the Eucharist, right? You're literally supposed to be eating the body of Christ. This moment that's like um, this extreme violence and also supposed to be this pleasure of like salvation. And so I'm really interested in those conflations and I've totally lost the root of what I'm answering. But I would just say, <laughs> I'm interested. So those, those are the, some of the few poems that really lit me up. I think I was really interested too in Ginsburg when I was younger and just like this like, humbly long poem that was interested in politics um and I think I was really excited because when you're young and you're dealing with all these intense emotions it's the first time you might be hearing your parents yelling or understanding heartbreak and I was able to kind of alchemize a lot of those unsayable feelings or abstract feelings and concretize them in the container of a poem and that felt really powerful to um siphon my emotions through words and through images and through the vehicle of metaphor to describe and compare what I was feeling from another, some unworldly process. And that feels like a powerful type of magic when you're 16 years old, especially when you, when you don't know how to advocate or talk for yourself. So I think that initial spark started my kind of poetry, falling in love with poetry. And it was also the first thing that I realized that I was good at something, that my brain kind of worked in poems when it, I, I really kind of suffered in my other classes, you know, especially in math. So when I found poetry, it, it felt like I had found a way to see myself and also connect to the, to the world through words. Uh, there's a question uh, for, for me is, is uh, Tiana's book available at the bookstore? And yes, it is. So you can go there to the shipyard at any point and get that. So please do. Um, and another question. Uh, so Shannon is asking if 
you can, or if you still recite Phenomenal Woman to yourself before reading, she remembers that that was something in an interview. You know, I don't, but I will say, Shannon, I think that poem is just knitted inside of my soul, you know, like, um, phenomenal woman you know that's me I think that poem is just kind of burned in my psyche if there's like a, a tattoo in my poetic soul that poem is there um I still think about that that moment um and because the judges pulled me aside and they said you did an amazing job but that poem was inappropriate for age bracket and it made us feel uncomfortable and because uh, I gave a speech about my Dr. Maya Angelou uh you know being sexually assaulted when she was young because she lost her ability to speak and it was poetry that gave her the power to speak again and I thought that was a magnificent thing to share um and yeah so I, I carry that poem with me I think there's just certain poems you kind of always carry in your heart pocket um and I think you know Dr. Maya Angelou, Lucille Clifton, Gwendolyn Brooks, Phyllis Wheatley, Rita Dove, Natasha Trathaway, um Tracy K. Smith, I mean Black women poets um, Honoré Fanon Jeffers, Bybee Francis, I will always carry their legacies with me wherever I go. Um, you know, earlier I said, you know, I didn't really have a model. There, there are Black poets, there aren't a lot of us, but there are, but I also think, think about that Lucille Clifton poem, when she come celebrate with me, where she goes, I had no model. I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay. And I think so often Black women artists of all genres have to have this kind of imp improvisation. So I think I, um, definitely carry the voices of, of all black women writers with me um as i as i continue on my journey but i love that question though maybe i will start doing that as a little well, as a little ritual uh dr peters has a a question and a comment here he says i love this reading so much so engaging thinking about your process with these musical pop cultural icons would you say you do any research loosely defined anything from libraries to just sitting and listening and yes you know, but i love research so i thought i wanted to be a historian before i ever wanted to be a poet and um i started getting freaked out because the more that i was studying the archive everything was coming out in poems and i was like crap what job is there for a historian who likes to write in verse and i was like oh a poet <laughs> um so i really love research and so that can be anywhere from libraries i'm up in jstor you know, Project Muse, um, you know, I mean, I, I go on YouTube deep dives, um, reading other poems, reading other works, um, you know, paying close attention to the world around me. Um, for me, I really like pulling in pop culture because something that I've realized for myself is that I'm actively writing against mastery or legacy. I don't care if my work has timestamps. I think all artists respond to the world around them. It's something Nina Simone said, she was just like, how can you be an artist and not reflect the times? Because people were asking her like, why are you keep on talking about all this civil rights shit? Like, why don't you just go back to like singing, like, you know, you know, birds flying high, you know, you know how to feel. And she was just like, how can you, how can I not speak about what's happening right now? Right. Um, and so for me, um, pulling in pop culture, you know, isn't a radical act to me, it might be radical to some other people, but to me, like if, if um, you know, Rilke is gonna speak about Rodan or, you know, Keats is gonna talk about the Grecian urn, like I'm gonna pull on Rihanna and I'm gonna put Rihanna on the same plane and in the field of the, and the poem and say like, these are the, these, this, this is a music video that, that I can see myself. Um, so I, I think that sense of urgency is really important to me and that, and that sense of survival. And so pulling on pop culture references is something that I really like to do. Um, but yeah, I, I like defining research. I mean, I do with my taxes. I tell them my Netflix and my Spotify account. I write that off of my taxes as research, R&D, baby. <laughs> so um, yeah, I love watching documentaries. And you know, to me, when you're a writer, you're paying close attention to the world around you. I think about Mary Oliver, like she might be up in the grass and with the grasshoppers, you know, and I might be on a weird YouTube deep dive about Kanye and Rihanna, but we're both we're both using the same poetry antennas, you know, to pull and gather. And and I said earlier in Dr. Meek's class, I feel like a magpie. I'm just trying to find those shiny objects and, and weave them into my poems. I think we have just one last question. And so Sam from class today asks if you could repeat that Lucille Clifton line that you oh, yeah, it's once you come celebrate with me, find it on Poetry Foundation and poets.org. Um but there's a line in there, she just says, I had no model. I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay. Um, and it ends, once you come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Thank you, incredible poem too. 
Tiana, thank you so much for really fabulous reading. Thank you all for being here with us. And remember, you can follow this up with getting Tiana's book tomorrow at the, the shipyard. And thank you again. We'll see you all next time. Yeah, thank you all so much for the great questions and thoughtful engagements. And thank you so much to Barry College. Shannon, thank you for that amazing, amazing intro. Thank you, Dr. Meek and to Will and Clint. I appreciate it so much. And thank you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Good night, everybody.